Hey, this is Justin at Adrenaline Barbecue Company, and today I'm gonna to show you how to make a competition-worthy brisket, and we're gonna do the whole thing using the charcoal kettle and the slow and sear. So I'm gonna be really honest with you up front. Brisket is not the easiest cut of meat to cook. Um, and the reason for that is because the brisket muscles make up uh, the front chest region of the cow that controls the movement of those front legs. And there's a lot of connective tissue in that meat. And so if you don't cook it right, it, it won't turn out very good. But don't worry, today I'm gonna show you exactly how to do this correctly so that you'll get a great brisket every single time. So as I mentioned earlier, brisket is the muscles on the front of the cow that control movement of the cow. And it's actually made up of, of a group of two muscles. Up here on top, we have what's called the flat. And then over here and underneath, we have what's called the point. And you can buy these together or separate. Um, you could buy just the flat or just the point. In this case, we bought both together and we're gonna cook both at the same time. That's called a packer brisket. And um, that's my favorite way of cooking it, but you have to keep in mind that these can get rather large. So if you're cooking this on a 22 inch kettle with the slow and sear, try to get something that's smaller than 15 pounds just so it'll fit best in your cooker. If you're using a 26 inch cooker with a slow and sear, don't worry about that because just about any brisket will fit, but you do need to limit your sizes when it comes to the 22 to 15 pounds or less. Also, one bit of advice is if you can afford it, go ahead and spring for a choice or prime grade brisket because it will have a dramatic impact on the final outcome. You're gonna spend all day working on this. You might as well have the best brisket possible at the end of the day. So Packer briskets have a layer of fat on one side that's commonly called the fat cap. And uh, that isn't gonna render down and it's not gonna taste very good. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut that back to about a quarter of an inch. So every brisket is different. So there's a little bit of trial and error involved in this process, but I wanna show you this. This is what the meat looks like, okay? And if you, get, if you start cutting and you come to this, you've gone too far. And don't worry if you're cutting and you see this, just back up and cut about a quarter inch above that and it will be fine. We're gonna put rub on this and we're gonna smoke this for 12 hours and when we're done, little things like this, like you'll never be able to tell. It's not a big deal. In fact, some people remove the fat cap completely and the brisket turns out fine. So don't stress out about it, but just understand that there is a little bit of trial and error involved and every brisket's different and over time you'll get better than better at it. But this this is what you want to see. This right here and this is this is the meat. This is how you know you've gone too far. And so just let that be your guide. Just back up, go a little higher and keep going. And there it is. It's as simple as that. It doesn't look pretty. In fact, I'm gonna trim this up a little bit. Um, it doesn't look pretty yet, but it will. And uh, interestingly, this is one of the smallest fat caps I've actually had on a full pack of brisket that didn't have the fat cap removed completely. So like I said, they are all different. So now that the fat cap's off, we're gonna go ahead and dry brine it. And dry brine is just a fancy way of saying pre-salting. Um, and you wanna use about a quarter of a teaspoon per pound if you're using table salt. Uh, maybe a half a teaspoon if you're using kosher salt. And, and the idea here is you just wanna get this all over the entire surface of the meat. And what this does for you is, it, of course it enhances the flavor of the meat, but it also allows it to re retain, retain moisture during the long cooks. So I, I like to use these metal pans because right after I'm done here, I'm gonna put this in the fridge and I'm gonna let this sit for a couple days and allow that salt to penetrate. And once that is done, I'll be back.
So we have our kettle set up to cook low and slow with the slow and sear. As you can see, we have a drip pan on this side. That's our drip and griddle pan. You can check that out on our website. But if you don't have that, any drip pan will do. And then on this side, we've got a fire starter cube right here in the corner and about 12 briquettes. I'm gonna light that fire starter. And once that gets going, I'm gonna stack these briquettes right around it. You want to be careful here because if, if you're not careful, you can actually put your fire starter out. So you got to make sure you give it plenty of room to breathe. Now our fire cube is burned down and we're going to fill up the slow and sear the rest of the way with charcoal. So now our slow and sear is full of charcoal. We have three pieces of hickory wood here. And now we're going to add our water. It's important to add boiling water. And the reason for that is we want to get that steaming as quickly as possible so that we can have a moist uh, cooking environment the entire time we're cooking. Now when you do this, you want to make sure you wear gloves because this will splatter a little bit because the slow and sear is hot. The slow and sear is designed to hold one quart of water and that should steam off at an even rate and you should be able to go five hours without ever having to refill the reservoir. So we're going to start off with our upper vents 100% of the way open and our lower vents about halfway open. And then once the temperature inside the cooker gets to about 170 degrees, we're going to start to close those up and we'll put our upper vents at about a third of the way open and our lower vent at a quarter of the way open. Now keep in mind that cooking temperatures can be dramatically affected by ambient conditions such as wind, weather, and even altitude. So you may have to make adjustments from there. So really quickly, this is what our setup looks like. We've got our brisket in the cooker on this side. The fat cap is down and we're using a remote thermometer to monitor everything. As you can see, we've got our meat probe in the thickest part of the flat and then our our uh, pit probe is right here. It's about two inches away from the meat itself. That way you get the more accurate reading and that's the way this is gonna sit for the next several hours. Also, you'll see I've got the top vent on the opposite side of the fire and the reason you do that is so when that smoke and hot air exits the cooker, it goes over the top of the brisket in the process. So I thought now would be a good time to kind of discuss our game plan for today. Really this cook is divided up into three phases. In the first phase we're going to cook low and slow up until the point the meat hits what's called the stall. And the stall is where the moisture inside the meat starts to evaporate out a little bit like sweating and what that does is it holds the temperatures down for an extended period of time. And so in order to speed up the cook during the second phase, we're gonna bring the temperatures up inside the cooker to about 275 degrees, and that's gonna let us power through that stall. Now, if you like to cook at 225, feel free to do that if you're a purist. We're just gonna speed things up a little bit in this cook to shave a little bit of time, because this is gonna be an all-day cook. Now, once we get to about 180, we're gonna kinda of play this by ear, but about 180 internal temperature and the bark is set, we're going to take the brisket and wrap it in foil. And what that will do is that will help facilitate the breakdown of the collagen and connective tissue so that that meat will get really, really soft and juicy on the inside. Okay guys, I'm about four hours into this and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an update here. Everything's working exactly as it's supposed to. The brisket's coming along nicely. It's at 146 internal temp, but it hasn't hit the stall yet. What I decided to do is um, go ahead and sweep out my ash. I pushed them, all my, all my leftover coals off to one side, and I'm gonna add more charcoal now. And um, I've got about a half of a slow and sear of charcoal, which is exactly what you'd expect after it's been burning for four or five hours. Um, I was gonna do that later once I hit the stall and up the temperatures, but decided that um, the weather's the weather forecast isn't looking good so I'm gonna keep an eye on that and uh, but I don't know I don't know what the conditions are gonna be like whenever I turn on the camera again so I thought I'd go ahead and take care of that now but I thought you guys would enjoy this look at the brisket it's coming along great I'm really happy with the progress so far and I can't wait to eat it it smells so good right about now oh 
I wish you could smell it. We need to invent smell vision So we're seven hours in and this brisket looks great. We're about 151 internal temp on the brisket and it's been there for a while so I'm gonna raise the temps inside the cooker to about 275 and we're gonna power through this stall uh, it's been raining off and on over the last couple of hours so hopefully the weather will continue to hold off it's not raining now but the water pan is almost empty it's boiling out what's left and we don't need to add more at this point because we're raising our temp so everything's going exactly as it's supposed to and we'll talk to you in another couple hours so we're 11 hours into this and we, uh, I was hoping to power through the stall, but as it turns out, I kind of powered right into the stall. And, and that's, I mean, that's just the way it is with barbecue. Some, you, you know, you make your plan and you hope it works out, but sometimes you have to make adjustments. And today we had a storm roll through and uh, just took a little longer than we expected, but it's ready to go in the foil now. It's a, um, 187 degrees. And if you scratch it, little scratch there you can tell that bark is in place which means the bark is set and so it's ready to put into the foil so I've wrapped the brisket in two layers of aluminum foil and the reason you do that is to make sure you contain all those juices and then I stuck the temperature probe right back into the middle of the thickest part of the flat um, and you got to be careful when you do that because you don't want to accidentally poke a hole through your charcoal that's underneath because if you do that you get all the juices will run out and they'll end up in your grill. Once the internal temp of the brisket gets between 200 and 203 degrees, I'm gonna bring it inside and wrap it in towels and just let it rest inside a cooler for about two hours. I've also added some extra charcoal to my slow and sear and that should be just enough to get me to the end of the cook. So our brisket hit 203 degrees internal, so I pulled it out of the cooker, and now it's sitting in the cooler where it's gonna rest for a couple of hours. But one of the things I realized I forgot to mention was uh, the way you can tell when your brisket is done is when you take a probe thermometer, if you stick that into the thickest part of the flat of the brisket, if that goes in and it feels the resistance is about like you're putting it through butter, that's when you know the brisket's ready. All right, so our brisket is done resting. It's here on the counter, and now we're gonna slice it. And remember when you slice it, you wanna go against the grain and make it about as thick as a pencil. This looks so good. It's got a great smoke ring on it. I don't know if you can see that or not. Great smoke ring on it. I'm gonna give it a try here. Okay, that's, it's really good. It's obviously got a nice beefy flavor. You can kind of taste the cayenne pepper and the pepper, that's really coming through. So this is a, a little bit on the spicy side. I wouldn't call it too spicy, but it does have a little bit of a kick. You can taste, the bark is really, really well formed. It's got a nice, a nice texture to it. This is a really good recipe. You should try this at home. That's it for this one. If you have any questions about this recipe or want to see any of our other recipe videos, check us out at abcbarbecue.com or like us on Facebook. And remember, here at ABC Barbecue, we didn't invent the kettle, we perfected it. Thanks for watching.